It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of March 19th, 1999. We have four movies to look at today, so let's just go ahead and jump on on a new one. And we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, Ben Affleck and Sandra Bullock in the romantic comedy, Forces of Nature. So you got Ben Affleck playing this book jacket summary writer uh, who's ready to fly back to Savannah, Georgia to marry her fia his fiance, played by Maura Tierney. But then the plane crashes at takeoff and Ben is stranded at the airport, but soon meets this free-spirited woman played by Sandra Bullock who finds a man called Vic who offers him a ride in his rented car where they'll split the expenses. And among their troubled journey, the forces of nature seem to conspire against Ben as he gets better acquainted with this unpredictable woman. And soon he questions whether or not he should go through with marrying Bridget. It's the same kind of story we've seen done over and over again. In fact, Sandra Bullock has done a number of these type of films in the early night in the throughout much of the 90s and really it's not really all that good i mean this is a film that just moves way too fast the editing on this the cinematography on this is just all over the place and surprisingly the chemistry between these two really good actors ben affleck and sandra bullock just does not work at all like it just really does not have that ebb and flow that this film really needed and it just goes for the predictable jokes, the jokes that we've heard time and time again, the jokes that aren't really all that funny, aren't really all that clever, but it's a romantic comedy, so we gotta throw them in there. We gotta have the third act breakup, we gotta have the wire revealed, we gotta have the, you know, all, all the romantic comedy cliches, and it just doesn't work. It's a movie that really, with the talent that they have on here and this director that they have, Brown and Hughes, who would later go on to direct the much better, who directed Harriet the Spy before this. I, think, I thought for a second he directed Snow Day, but um, that is not the case. Um, actually, it's a she. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I got that confused. But um, uh, she had directed Harriet the Spy, which was okay for what it was, but... Yeah, I got, you kind of expect her to revolve as a filmmaker after that, with her first film and all that, but... Um, it's also written by Mark Lawrence, who would have much better success with Sandra Bullock the following year with Miss Congeniality, and went on to become a director in his own right. But this, this is just not a good film. Uh, Lawrence also wrote the uh, Outer Towners remake we talked about a couple weeks ago, which was not that great. But I'll give it this: it's this is probably a little bit better, but not by that much. I mean, it's a film that you think could have been so that easily could have been so much better, but the cinematography is just all over the place. The editing is all over the place. Like, they edit it like an action movie at, the se as, at some points. It's just kind of like, uh, really? Like, why do you have to throw this wacky editing in here? It's just all over the place. And, like I said, the leads don't have the chemistry that really needed to be here to make this work. I mean, Sandra Bullock and Ben Affleck can have chemistry in movies, and I would have liked to have seen another film with them together, but... Here, it just doesn't work. It goes through the same cliches we've seen done over and over again. It's boring. It's not funny. It's uninventive. It gets annoying at several points. It's not a good film. It's not a worthy film at all. Avoid it like the plague. Uh, that's for, But uh, that's Forces of Nature. So on to the next movie, Clint Eastwood in True Crime. So Clint Eastwood plays this Oakland Tribune journalist with a passion for women and alcohol and is given the coverage of the upcoming execution of this murderer played by Isaiah Washington. His attractive colleague, played by Mary McCork, died in a car accident the night before, and uh, his boss, played by Dennis Leary and hu husband to Steve's current affair, wants him dead and gone as soon as possible. And when Steve stumbles across the possibility of this guy being innocent on death row, he feels his time has come. Now Steve only has a few hours left to prove the innocence of this guy and to be right with his theory, and he will definitely be history if he's not. And really the biggest fault of this movie, honestly, is that it kind of reminds me of way too much, like a more serious, more deep t To Kill a Mockingbird, and it just doesn't quite work. It's one of the, This is part of a time when Clint Eastwood made these movies that he was kind of on a low streak at this point. Like some of his movies that he was putting out as a director were not really turning out to be that great. And uh, this one definitely is not one of his stronger films. And uh, he would kind of follow it up with probably the film that brought him back on track a little bit with Space Cowboys, which is much more mainstream. This one feels like it's trying a little too hard to figure out what kind of an audience it wants to sell to. Does it want to be the type of film that, that sits around with a limited crowd or does it want to be a straightforward mainstream film? And the mystery really is not that intriguing. I mean, that trailer alone, you could pretty much tell what the actual is what's the actual what's actually going to happen when this is all said and done. I mean, like there's really no reason to watch this film. And Clint Eastwood has made a lot of better films, and 
And uh, I think a lot of people back then really saw, thought the same thing because this film was not a big hit whatsoever. It was a big bomb. It was cost fifty five million dollars. Only bought back in sixteen million dollars. So people were rightfully stepping away from this film pretty quickly. And honestly, I can't put blame it for that because the film really was not that good. It was not. It was a major disappointment for Clint Eastwood. And like I said, he kind of go back on track a little bit after this next film that com comes in two thousand with Space Cowboys, but. This was kind of the end of a little bit of a lull for him after with Absolute Power, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, and then True Crime. And uh, he'd come back on track to start the new millennium off. So uh, That's True Crime. And uh, here's another Warner Brothers bomb that came out on the same weekend in 1999. The animated adaptation of The King and I. So yeah, what that trailer doesn't also tell you is that it's actually produced by Rankin Bass, uh, the company, of course, the company that gave us Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Foster the Snowman. In fact, the director of this is Richie R is Richard Rich, who also gave us the Swan Princess, which was also a Disney knockoff, but at least it was trying compared to this movie. I mean, this is loosely based off of Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical of the same name, and loosely you'll fit you'll automatically see right away if you watch the film how loosely this thing starts off with. But we'll get to that in just a second, but. It portrays a fictional account of English school teacher Anna Lynn Owens, played by uh, Miranda Richardson here, as the, an historic encounter with the King of Siam in the royal court. And Martin Vidnotic plays Moncout, and you also have Ian Richardson, Daryl Hammond, Adam Wiley. Uh, the songs in the movie are pretty much taken from the musical, and they said that the writers of this took creative liberties with the history and the source material for the musical in a tape to make the film palatable to all audiences. And... Um, yeah, they did that, and um, like I said, right from the get-go, the film literally begins with the villain of the film, who is the, um, who is the, um, who is uh, Kralahome, who's actually a friend of the king in the in the musical, but here they're making the bad guy because hey, Disney had the same thing too, and let's give him a comic sidekick too, played by Daryl Hannah, who's got this really bad Asian voice that he adds on to this role. I mean, this is. I mean, that's just, that's one of the things that's wrong with it, but his first thing he does when he sees the school teacher is like, I'm going to give her a massive sea serpent and try to kill her, even though I need her to be part of my plan to take over the kingdom, and that is just one of the many th problems with this movie that you'll see right away. The anime, the scenes in here make no sense, the animation is really, really sloppy, like, the Swan Princess was at least trying to put together some nice animation, and actually had fluid animation at times, but this, you could just tell that this was just a really best, is bad film right from the get-go. It's just kind of like, the jokes aren't funny. Everybody has a sidekick, a, a comic sidekick in here that they were clearly trying to sell toys off of. I mean, this is a film that was just, it's it's almost as, it's not as bad as Quest for Camelot, but it comes pretty damn close to being a straight-up Disney knockoff in the worst possible way. Like, nothing about the story makes any sense. It has no charm to it. The animation is not that great. The music is not that great either, and I honestly can't really delve into this much more. Much more in a way that I could actually add to something to it. If you want to see a better example of how to look at this movie, go watch the Nostalgia Critics King and I review because he did that a whole lot better, covering the history of the story, which has quite an intriguing history with the many different versions they've done of this. But. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was actually one of two films based off of The King and I we got in 1999, the other being Anna and the King with Jodie Foster, and we'll find out later on down the year how that turned out, but uh, this one, pfft, not so much. So, on to the last film, and that is Ravenous. So, yeah, I never even heard of this movie before I even heard, did this, but... Um, this is a horror western cannibal film starring Guy Pearce, Robert Carlyle, Jeffrey Jones, and David Arquette. And the story is that um, you have this guy, Captain John Boyd, who receives a promotion after dealing, defeating the enemy command in the Battle of the Mexican-American War. But because the general realizes it was an act of cowardice that got him there, he's given a backhanded promotion to Fort Spencer, where he's third in command. The others at the fort are two Indians, George and his sister Martha, who come, came with the place, Chaplain Toffler, Wright the Soldier, Cleves, a drugged-up cook, and Knox, who is frequently drunk, when a Scottish stranger named Colquhoun appears and recovers from frostbite almost instantly after being bathed, he tells the story about a party leader named Ives, who was eating members of the party to survive. As part of their duty, they must go up to the cave where this occurred to see if any of them survived, only to, 
Only Martha Knox and Cleve stay behind, and George warns that since Colquhoun admits eating human flesh, he might be a Wendigo, which is a ravenous, cannibalistic creature, which sounds like a badass idea for a movie, and um, it didn't do so bad critically. It got a mixed reception, which for a movie like this isn't the worst thing possible, and there's actually been attempts to make a story like this. Uh, Trey Parker, of course, did Cannibal the Musical, which is a funny black comedy that was made before he, he and Matt Stone created South Park. We later got uh, Bone Tomahawk, which was seen a whole lot better. But this is a film that definitely has a very interesting idea to it, and one that I might actually want to check out, because you got a lot of good talent in here, and it just sounds like a creative idea overall. I just feel like maybe it was a little bit too ahead of its time. It was, it, I mean, it wasn't as big of a flop as something like Wing Commander was, but... Um, it still did well enough to it still did well enough to garner a cult following to it, and at least people like this one compared to Wing Commander. But um, I'm actually kind of curious to check this one out. We are in Halloween season by the time I'm recording this. It's October third, two thousand twenty-three. So I don't know. Maybe I can look around for this, and maybe I can actually watch it because I'm actually really curious to see what this is like. So, so uh, yeah, not much more to say about that one. That is ravenous. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and we'll wrap March off next time with three movies, Ron Howard's star-studded Ed TV, The Mod Squad, and Doug's first movie. So three films we'll look at next time. So until then, thank you very much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode. Also, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So with that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.